We believe that the future of Africa lies in its vast land. We believe the future is in the hands of those who walk the fields. But those are the hands that feed nations and ensure a better and more productive Africa. We believe in those hands and that is why we too bring our hands in support of them. Our hands come bearing technologies and solutions that ensure their effort is not in vain, but deliver results, results that ensure a sustainable, prosperous, and food secure Africa. At AATF, we are driving transformation of livelihoods in sub Saharan Africa through innovative agricultural technologies that deliver results. We promise to deliver prosperity through technology. Hello. Greetings to you, ladies and gentlemen, attending this webinar. I am Dennis Mosia Chetere, the Executive Director of AATF and your moderator today. On behalf of myself and the AATF fraternity, we welcome you all to our second webinar of the year, Karibun Sana, which is Swahili for your World Cup. Before I introduce the panelists, let us take a quick review of the issues at hand for today's webinar. Our discussion today will focus on transforming African agriculture through mechanization for productivity and prosperity. This webinar converges critical players who will be deliberate on key strategies to enhance access and application of agricultural mechanization in Africa. They include the World Bank, we are still waiting for a colleague from AU, Kulai, which is a digital solution provider, Agoko Future Farm that manufactures and distributes agricultural equipment, and the National Agricultural Research Organization of Uganda, NARO. Our panel of experts will help us unpack and gain clarity on the role of mechanization in improving Africa's productivity and competitiveness. As we are aware, Africa has unrivaled and untapped potential in the use of agricultural mechanization. Mechanization can contribute towards intensified crop production and reduced drudgery, yet its application along the agricultural value chain is still limited. At AATF, we believe the transformative nature of agricultural mechanization can be tapped through collaborative efforts. This requires all relevant stakeholders, including policymakers, the private sector, farmers, and development partners to work together. We must, however, recognize that the deployment of productivity enhancing technologies alone may not yield substantial benefits for smallholder farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa. Effective technology deployment needs to be accompanied by appropriate crop management practices and strategies such as agriculture mechanization. I would like to introduce our esteemed panel of experts. From the World Bank, we will come Dr. Pamesh Shah. Dr. Shah is a global lead for rural livelihoods and agricultural jobs at the World Bank. In this role, he provides leadership to the bank's work and supports development of our global knowledge and learning to offer solutions to clients and other development partners. Welcome, Pamesh. You can greet the audience. Thanks, Dr. Dennis, and welcome, everyone. Good to be here today. Thank you. 
Thank you. You're welcome again. I'm not yet sure if we, Dr. Slippis is there. Is, are you there? Okay. That's our colleague from AU at the moment. I can go to the others. I now invite Kalongo Chiteji. She's the senior manager at Agoko Future Farm in Zambia. She won the 2016 CEO Global Africa's Most Influential Women in Business and Government Award. Kalongo is a PhD candidate at Lourdes University and has authored farming, a book, Farming as a Business, an Examination of the Gender Perspective. Welcome, Kalongo. The next, from our friends down south, we invite Brett. Brett is the commercial director at CRI. He's responsible for developing and implementing commercial strategies in the agricultural industry. Brett holds a master's in entrepreneurship and new venture creation from Wits Business School, South Africa. Welcome you, Brett. From our neighboring Uganda, we will come Dr. Chris Omongo, the principal research officer and cassava researcher from the National Agricultural Research Organization in Uganda. Chris is a renowned scientist who has over 20 publications under his belt. Welcome Chris and the former colleague at NARO. Finally, we have George Thank Maritain. you very much. Welcome, nice yes. to be here. So welcome again. Uh, finally, we have George Marichera, who is the business development manager at AATF and also the managing director of AgroDrive Limited. For your information listeners, AgroDrive is a social enterprise owned by AATF that specializes in mechanization service provision and agribusiness solution. George holds an MBA from Wolverhampton University, UK and has authored several book chapters and journal publications. Welcome, George, and welcome you all. And thank you. Thank you. Again. Thank you, Dennis. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Before I, we, I call upon the first uh, presenter, let's share the rules of our engagement today. We will begin with our discussion today with a 15-minute presentation by AATF to introduce the subject matter. This will be followed by four 10-minute presentation by our panelists that will give insights on different perspectives of agricultural mechanization. Colleagues would like to have an interactive session and we encourage you to kindly post your questions or comments on the chat box and we'll collect them for response by the panelists. May I now invite George Marichera to speak to us on the topic of the day. George, the floor is yours. You're welcome. Yeah, good day to everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking to you uh, today on this very important topic on uh, uh, mechanization. And um, uh, this is a topic that like Dennis has indicated, is uh, very important in as much as we try by all means to, to ensure that there is a transformative agriculture development in, in Africa. I'll first of all uh, give you an outline of my presentation. I'm going to look at mechanization in the global uh, aspect I'm going to look at facts and figures in terms of mechanization in Africa, then highlight on the, the need for us to have an agriculture value chain approach to mechanization. Lessons from case studies, this pertains to what AATF has managed to do to bankroll mechanization across Africa. Then finally, but not least, look at uh, the critical success factors that will facilitate mechanization and commercialization of such. Uh, we all know and appreciate that the world population is growing and the 
is going to increase by 2.1 billion from 7.7 .7 to 9.8 billion. And you also appreciate the fact that the African population will increase from 1 billion to almost 2.4 billion by 2050. So if you look at this population growth, you can highly or you can appreciate that we are actually going to double our population in Africa. This means increased demand for food. And then you look at African countries, 75% of the African farmers are smallholder farmers. These are typically smallholder farmers that are growing crops or food stock on less than three, two hectares. Eh? And uh, if you see, because of the nature of their farm holdings, because of their uh, access to technologies, their yield per unit area is very low. But again, we also appreciate that agriculture gives at least 11 times the return on investment. So we are looking at mechanization and say mechanization gives great opportunity for smallholder farmers to transform from subsistence farmers to commercial farming. And in this slide, I would want really to highlight what mechanization is all about. We all know and appreciate that most people define mechanization in terms of production in agriculture. And the mechanization is viewed like tillage, where when you're doing mechanization, people talk of plowing. But from an ATF point of view and a global point of view of mechanization, mechanization needs to be grow, viewed on a global level. Where are you looking mechanization at production, mechanization at post-harvest, mechanization at um, at uh, processing and then you also look at mechanization and post harvest management that being the case we look at mechanization as those that can actually be able to ensure that all our mechanization is happening across the globe so when you look at mechanization we are looking at a situation whereby we need to ensure that uh, all the value chain players are able to ensure that mechanization is taken on board. So when you look at mechanization across the value chain, we are looking at mechanization at primary, uh, where you're looking at primary tillage. This is where you're looking at spraying. Excuse me. And uh, in this case, we start with plowing, where you're doing land preparation. And by land preparation, we are looking at mechanization that does the plowing, the harrowing, ensure that mechanization is able to uh, capture and they do the land preparation appropriately. We are also spraying, where mechanization is able to, we are using chemicals, be it herbicide, being sexy to ensure that we are able to control the, the weeds. Then you look at mechanization in planting, then you look at mechanization at uh, weeding, then you look at mechanization and harvesting. So by so doing and looking at the value chain approach to mechanization, we are ensuring that mechanization is able to actually ensure that we end up having mechanization from land preparation to industrial processing. And when you look at industrial processing, you are not only looking at processing at industry level, but also looking at how we can do mechanization. And we are looking at community processing, also processing, at the end of the day, we are able to get good results. Judge, could you share the presentation, please? We are not seeing it. Okay. Sorry, colleagues, the judge is uh, trying to share his slides so that you can follow him up. Can you see, can, can you see now? 
the slides can they be seen now? Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But I will also just share from we, we, we are listening to what we are talking. Are you seeing? Okay. Are you seeing now? You are not sharing. Sorry? Sorry. Please come. Okay. Uh, Dennis, can I continue? Can you see these the, 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 the slides now? Not yet. Okay. Okay. Again, sorry for that small hitch. The situation is being corrected. We believe that the future of Africa lies in his vast land. We believe the future is in the hands of those who walk the fields. But those are the hands that feed nations and ensure a better and more productive Africa. We believe in those hands, and that is why we too bring our hands in support of them. Our hands come, bearing technologies and solutions that ensure their effort is not in vain, but deliver results, results that ensure a sustainable, prosperous, and food secure Africa. At AATF, we are driving transformation of livelihoods in sub-Saharan Africa through innovative agricultural technologies that deliver results. We promise to deliver prosperity through technology. Okay, the floor is still yours, George. Okay, sorry, so, sorry for that, uh, Dennis, and sorry, uh, colleagues. Um, uh, so we are looking at um, mechanization along the value chain, and um, we are saying mechanization has to be done across the whole entire value chain. And by so doing, we are looking at mechanization in late preparation, mechanization in planting, mechanization in weeding, and mechanization at harvest. And by so doing, this will actually ensure that we end up having uh, we end up having we end up having a very solid value chain that we can actually be able to support across the across the end uh, 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 crop value chain. And uh, for us to have good mechanization, we need to come up with a good mechanization strategy. And in this good mechanization strategy, we are looking at 
how can you ensure that small older farmers are able to access mechanization? And in this case, not all farmers are able to access mechanization in the fact that not all farmers can be able to get tractors. But the best strategy for us is to ensure that there's mechanization service provision, which becomes a viable option in which farmers are provided with mechanization services and these farmers pay for these mechanization services. And it's through the experience from AATF, we have managed to ensure that farmers can be identified and then they are given access and delivery of the right mechanization equipment for different operations. There's farmer aggregation, clustering and training on the mechanization and farming as a business. There's identification of local entrepreneurs and training them to be service providers. Then you also need to train tractor operators to ensure that this can actually provide the mechanization service fully aware of what operations need to be done, how to couple tractors, how to put in the mechanization support equipment and ensure that the, the services are done professionally. Then you also need to come up with the mechanization model farms. Then you leave region digital technology to optimize efficiency and reach the last mile then a financial inclusion to ensure farmers get realizable financing. And this can be done through contract farming, microfinancing, government support, project financing, and also farmers generating income that will actually be able to ensure that they are able to pay. And within mechanization, we also need to look at how we can mainstream gender for women and youth so that they are actively involved in, in, uh, in mechanization. And for there to be successful mechanization, we need to come up with what we call a systems approach to mechanization, where we say mechanization alone cannot be the silver bullet. Mechanization needs to be integrated with improved seed systems, where you are using high quality, improved seed varieties. We need to look at agronomy, we are looking at the right time, the right planting time, and the right population or plant density in the sense that, for example, when you're dealing with maize, we need to ensure that we have at least 50,000 and above in terms of the population stand in terms of the maize. For cassava, you have to make sure that we have at least 12,000 plants per hectare. And by so doing, this then when it integrated with IT and farmer aggregation, and we provide mechanization, then because of increased yield, because of increased um, uh, efficiency, we also now need to link up to agro-processing. And then we then link with management as a business. So in a long term, we are looking at a systems approach to mechanization that will ensure that at the end of the day, we have a good value chain development and farmers are able to benefit from mechanization. And the systems approach also link is very well where we think the mechanization should not only be done for the sake of being mechanization. We need to understand the market. What are the market dynamics that the smallholder farmers are faced with so that when they're able to produce increased yield, they are also able to get markets for their yield. So you look at mechanization market analysis, you look at the farmer aggregation and engagement, we look at input support. If you are going to have a good tractor, you are going to have a good planter, but you don't have the right inputs. It also means you're not going to have good yield and it also means that you're not going to be able to produce and be able to get viable markets so the mechanization approach should actually ensure that we tie in the equipment we tie in the inputs then you put prioritize the mechanization based on the farmer needs you all know that african countries are different levels of mechanization so there are some countries that might need big tractors there are some countries that might need three wheeler tractors, and there are some that may need levels of mechanization that will support this typical small order farmers. And again, we then need to also tie in and build the technical support to ensure that these farmers are able to plant in good time, they're able to identify crop value chains that are sustainable, they provide product marketing, and then there's business sustainability. I'll give you a good example of uh, a case study for mechanization, which the African Agriculture Technology Foundation has managed to bankroll. Uh, in 2012, AATF realized that cassava is one of the major crops that is uh, grown uh, in Africa, and many countries are growing the crop. 
But we realized that uh, productivity per unit area was very low. When you compare to other countries, we realized that in Africa, yield was around seven tons a hectare. But when you go to Brazil, it was around 45 tons, Thailand around 36 tons, Indonesia around uh, 48 tons. So we decided to say, what really is it that other countries are doing that we are not doing in Africa? So we identified and realized that in all these countries, cassava was fully mechanized. And thus, cassava was viewed as a commercial crop, and that really gave it more mileage in terms of processing. So we started a project called the Cassava Mechanization and Agro Processing Project. That, was, that is implemented in Nigeria, Zambia, Uganda, and Tanzania. And the objective of this project is to increase cassava productivity and the incomes for the farmers, to improve the timeliness of for uh, efficiency of uh, operations, to reduce drudgery and improve quality of work, and also to improve and promote employment. I'm happy to report that the progress to date with the Kama project has seen over 450 households being impacted. We have managed to increase yield from 30 tons, from nine tons to 30 tons. We have managed to have yield increase we have managed to have income increase and a reduction in, in drudgery. And through this project, we have managed to come up with a business model where we actually work through public-private partnership, where we demonstrate the technology to the small order farmer. We support them with the mechanization implement where we can actually have a cassava planter, where it can actually be able to cut the stems into equal pieces, bury the stems, apply fertilizer, and then if you look at the time it takes to do the cassava mechanization, the time you can take up to an hour to plant the whole one hectare, when in actual fact, traditionally it will take more than 30 days for one man to plant one hectare. Again, if you look at the come up results, you also know that uh, with mechanization, the cost per unit or per hectare is very low. When you are doing manual planting, it takes more than 240 hours, it will cost you 180 manual operation. But they're doing mechanical operations, it will take you an hour and a half and it will cost you less than $140 a per hectare. Same applies with stem preparation, weeding, and harvesting. And like I've already indicated, we have cases where we have money to increase yield from seven tons to 30 tons. And we also have cases in Zambia where, for example, Mr. Mushiri managed to increase his yield from seven tons to 56. In, in Nigeria, we had the case of Pastor Felix, who managed to actually start with three hectares, and now he's actually farming over 300 hectares. And in terms of income, we've seen farmers generating income from 500 US dollars per hectare to over, they are over 2,000. And this mechanization approach is very key in the sense that it helps the small order farmers by substituting or removing the drudgery in farming and ensuring that all the mechanization operations are done from tillage, planting, uh, weeding, and the website application and harvesting. So the farmer benefits by increasing yield, by reducing drudgery, by being efficient, and at the end of the day, we end up having farmers making more money. And again, for anyone investing as an entrepreneur in make, entrepreneur and mechanization service provider, provision, we also note that these are able to increase their profit margin. Initially, mechanization was done only for tillage, but now with provision of mechanization across the value chain, the one who is invested in tools is able to generate a lot of income by mechanizing throughout the value chain. Then in terms of approach, and creating demand. We have situations where we are actually providing mechanization for clusters of farmers. These are farmers that are aggregated, they come together, then we identify contiguous land, we work with them, then they access the mechanization service provision. We also have farmers that work as individuals. We provide the mechanization services, then they pay for the services, then we link them to the market. But we've also seen private sector investing in mechanization, in which case these are companies that own big pieces of land, and they are willing to work with small order farmers in supporting them in mechanization. 
And again, at the end of the day, mechanization is very gender sensitive in the sense that it actually gives room for women and youths to actually be fully integrated in farming. And this creates viable business. One of the things that AAT have managed to do is building on the experience in mechanization in uh, Nigeria, Zambia, Tanzania, and Uganda. We realize that mechanization can be provided sustainably. And at the moment, we have started a social enterprise that is peer in mechanization. And instead of only dealing with mechanization for cassava, we have diversified and we are now dealing mechanization across all crop value chains. So at the moment, we are doing mechanization for cassava, we have soya bean, we have rice, we have groundnuts, we have maize, and we have also diversified into fodder production in northern parts of Nigeria. And you appreciate that most of the farmers that you are working with are typically small order farmers. These are farmers who have managed to access the mechanization services, they have managed to increase yield, they are also able to pay for the mechanization services, ensuring that mechanization is provided sustainably. And to also ensure that we optimize on mechanization, we've started using digital agriculture. AATF, we have developed an app which is called AgriDrive, which assists farmers to actually book for mechanization services. With this app, it is an app that you can download from Play Store and is accessible online, offline, and through USSD. It enables farmers to book and pay for mechanization services. That's for this service, you can be able to book for plowing, harrowing, website application, harvesting, or haulage. And farmers can be able to fill in the details of where the, the farm is, the farm size, the date when they want the operations to be done, and then they can also be able to view the prices. And with this app, we have seen that a number of small order farmers are now able to access mechanization services without even uh, being very close to the mechanization service provider because through the use of the mobile app, we are then able to link farmers to the services. And for the mechanization service provider, one can actually be able to identify who and where the farmers are, what they need, the service they can be able to get, what time they can be able to get them, and then the use of fuel, and you can also track where the farmer, the, 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 so with that, then we can also use the app to support farmers with weather information, e extension in terms of agronomic practices. And there's also a call center that can link the farmers to be able to ask what service can be given or what extension information they can be able to receive to ensure that this is commercially done. And then the moment we are building relationship with Kurai to ensure that we also integrate digital technology through the use of drones to be able to do crop monitoring, website application, and ensure that farmers are able to get good services that will ensure that they can transit from small order farmers or subsistence farming to commercial farming. And again, through AATF, we managed to come up with a system called the Market Information Support System. Initially started off working as uh, supporting come up and being called Miss Come Up, but now we are actually integrating to include all other crops and this is a digital platform that facilitates provision of economically sustainable agriculture production, where we have farmer and farming information, where the farmer is, which crops they are producing, in what quantities, where they are selling them. And this information is used to link farmers to exchange and service providers to the market. And at the end of the day, they can be able to produce, knowing that there's a ready market for their crops. It can also be used for mechanization service provision, where they can be able to know where the mechanization service providers are, what they are, uh, when they are available, and the prices for the service they are providing. So for us to have mechanization provided to small order farmers, we are also looking at the delivery pathway. So you have a cases where you can have private individuals who are providing the services to the farmers and farmers are paying for those services. So by so doing, we are actually working with the small order farmers to ensure that they are able to receive or to get the services, they increase their productivity, they create wealth, and at the end of the day, they are happy farmers. But you can also have a case where mechanization is provided through associations, where farmers are clustered together 
they are working together as a team and then eventually the access mechanization then you also have government supported programs and again we also have institutions like aft facilitating mechanization making sure that the farmers are able to access this these services and at the end of the day they increase their yield there are five critical success factors for mechanization to be sustainable it's more the farmer would for us to be able to move uh, small older farmers from subsistence farming to commercial farming. The first thing is there needs to be sufficient demand for mechanization for it to be run as a sustainable business. In this case, you are looking at the realization of benefits for the farmers. Farmers have to benefit in terms of cost, in terms of time, and in terms of yield. There's need for ability to access equipment that is reliable and timely that means we should have the equipment that is readily available for farmers to be able to use those equipment we also need to have support system to ensure that you have enough spare parts that will enable the technician to actually instill confidence in the system these are the people who will be able to repair the tractors will be able to to service the tractor so that when there's any breakdown those challenges are addressed as soon as possible and the farmers able to um, get the services then you also have to have experienced tractor operators these are people who are trained in machinery management the usage the maintenance to ensure that these mechanization services are provided timely and they are quality service then lastly but not least there's need for the commercial business acumen to promote efficiency and sustainability. That we need to build uh, service excellence in the sense that when a farmer needs a service, the farmer is able to get that service within time. It needs to be well coordinated so that the farmers are able to increase productivity and thereby generate enough income. Thank you. And again, once again, th apologies for the network challenges. Uh, we are going to have our next presenter, who is uh, Dr. Pamesha. Uh, Pamesh, we are elated to have you here. Can they talk to us about the World Bank vision for mechanization and funding priorities for Africa? Over to you, Pamesh. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we heard a very excellent presentation from AATF uh, right now. And uh, it will be great to now listen to uh, what we are going to talk about is more the policy issues, basically, uh, which is, uh, I just want to share the screen one minute. It'll take me one minute to get there. Can all of you see the screen? Yes, it has come. Sure. So basically, I'm going to talk about what are the opportunities and challenges for sustainable financing of agriculture mechanization. Because uh, the main challenge we have in Africa is not that mechanization is not happening in Africa, but it's happening in, especially in some regions and some parts. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our perspective on how we look at mechanization and then in the end talk about how we are supporting uh, this agenda going forward. Uh, everyone knows that Africa region lags behind in use of tractors. And I don't have to tell this data of the global tractor use and all. But unfortunately, obsession with just looking at tractor data has not allowed us to look at mechanization in the real perspective. So agriculture mechanization goes beyond use of tractors. And unless and until we build an ecosystem for mechanization, which is beyond tractors, we are not going to see the kind of changes we are want in Africa. So the whole value chain, I think George has already talked about that. I'm not going to go through that. I think the whole gamut of things we are talking about, how do we transform the food system? And volumes and business will not come just from plowing it will come from a range of enterprises 
and uh, which I think will transform the food system. And it will attain criticality only if we work across the value chain. And uh, that's why it has been difficult to do it because most efforts have been focused more on the production part of it and have not looked at the other part of it. You, just to give you a data that even in countries like India and China and other places, I think transportation really makes uh, the mechanization viable. And I think uh, people make almost like 40% resources from transportation and tractors get used for all kinds of things, uh, just that. You know, people use it for irrigation, take the motor out and all kinds of things there. But clearly, this Africa story is very, very, uh, there are huge spatial variation in agriculture mechanization across regions of Africa. So you can see the number of tractors per thousand hectare in different economic regions of Africa. You have a huge variation from CMAC to SADAC. You can see whole amount of difference in the various regions. And uh, there are some examples of spatial variations of mechanization. You can see in Ethiopia, it gets practiced in Western Highlands. It's, if you look at Ethiopia's uh, Western Highlands data, it is as good as many regions of Asia. Similarly, if you look at Zimbabwe, although the tractor density looks very high, but 75% is only being done in the commercial farming sector and uh, smallholder farmers still don't have uh, access. And, and in Ghana also, if you take neighboring districts, uh, depending on population density and market access, uh, demand for mechanization can vary. And Kenya also, if you see high potential Rift Valley, Western lowlands have more mechanization. And again, uh, central northern zones more in Nigeria. And uh, you can see also that threshers are being used very extensively, which are primarily through private service providers. They cover almost 70% of area in the Bakalori, the, 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 one of the largest irrigation schemes in Nigeria. And uh, data, which if we just did a study on Ghana, showed that uh, nearly half of service providers surveyed in Ghana believe they are unable to meet demand. It means the demand is much more than what the service providers are able to provide. And, uh, and half feel that their tractors were being used to full capacity. So it means the, the, the scenario is such that you have many regions of Africa which are doing very well on mechanization. And what we need to is to create more nodes of such in intensity across the zones. So I think currently, uh, I think we have to study the sub-regional uh, pattern on mechanization and then see what has worked there and then try to, you know, uh, emulate some of the efforts which have been done in these regions. Now, clearly we have three types of service provision in mechanization in supply chain. It's a direct government service provision where the government uh, has public hiring stations. Then there are specialized private sector provision models. Uh, which are private enterprises that hire out mechanization services without their own cultivated farms. In Ghana and Nigeria, they have been established as standalone private service providers. And private farmer to farmer service provisions, uh, you know, primarily the large medium farmers who, who really provide services to others. Uh, farmer to farmer service provision has also worked well, but you can see clearly that it is inhibited by finance. 84% of medium scale farmers purchase their tractors using solely personal savings and only 3.4% use loans in, in Ghana. And everywhere the story is the same, that people have to use a lot of their own resources to invest in tractors. And we haven't been able to develop a financing model uh, which will be able to you know, uh, incorporate that kind of growth in the mechanization there. What are some of the lessons from past experience on agriculture mechanization? I think we have a sizable number of medium scale farmers and other entrepreneurs who provide mechanization and other services to other smallholder farmers. You have significant amount of entrepreneurial capacity of farmers and uh, they really have developed very, you, you have SMEs, you have franchisees, you have the kind of public private models that George was describing. You have opportunities to use tractors for on off farm activities, transport, construction, repair and maintenance of rural infrastructure. And there are policies which are required for industrialization, uh, which are complementary policies for food systems. 
and availability of land for purchase or leasing by individual farmers because you need to build some kind of you know assetize and monetize some amount of land in order to have a good mechanization uh, you know industry there is high level of effective demand uh, you can look at tube wells power tillers diesel engines you know rather than taking huge amount of machinery from other countries and then trying to develop so you need to create an effective demand for mechanizing equipment within africa and then local entrepreneurs dealing with repairs and manufacturing and then business and enterprise friendly policies laws and regulations what are some of the principles for transforming agriculture mechanization the first is that we should really look at the food system and the farming system uh, as opposed to looking at only tractors second you need to look at commercially sustainable agriculture machinery higher services and really use the kinds of things which george was describing in terms of digital approaches and all to really make this very sustainable we need to identify medium scale farmers and encourage development of viable commercial farming because everywhere uh, existence of medium farmers and commercial farming is the one which leads to small scale farmers also adopting it so that pathway needs to be developed further Uh, we need to really invest in on farm uh, productivity beyond on farm productivity to include post harvest systems and entire food chain and also we need to develop uh, different agro ecologies and farming systems need more customized mechanization and data and digital innovation need to be integrated to build new business models now we have been as why and you know uh, agri Uh, uh drive and all the things which george mentioned we have been working in kenya on a million farmer platform using digital data and technology and i think we have hello tractor is working with us to you know develop so that each device is fitted with this you know a, a kind of a device which allows us to monitor how mechanization is happening customized mechanization is happening and then also bring in a uber like platform for what agri drive described so that all the tractor in, uh, entrepreneurs drivers and the the farmers are on one platform and they are able to really reach there and our data is exactly the same which you know uh, george was saying is double the outreach of existing tractors cost of land preparation is reduced by 40% and there is significant increase in agriculture productivity we also feel that the solar powered area smart irrigation is also needs to be done in conjunction we are working with an uh, enterprise there called sun culture which has developed a plug and play model on portable irrigation system you pay as you grow because currently the payment is a problem so if you if you bring characteristics of as you pay for as you as you grow you pay you don't have to pay everything in the beginning so you bring in lot of devices and smart devices to grow irrigation and then to grow mechanism i feel that pay as you go approach is better in terms of financing in africa as opposed to looking for bulky credit schemes which have not worked some key recommendations i think the public sector has a crucial role i think uh, financing services of public goods is required because training licensing of machine operators r&d rural infrastructure i think pub, we have the public sector has to do more creating an enabling environment for private sector to finance mechanization investments we need appropriate laws for banking contracts and leasing regulations and we need providing sub, some subsidies for adoption of particular technologies like conservation agriculture technologies which will uh, go hand in hand with mechanization Uh, we also need to provide some direct support to companies involved in supply and hire services through technical assistance and business advisory services and we need input output marketing rural infrastructure services there uh, i think on farm use of tractors and machinery by promoting neighborhood contracting is very much required we need to review the existing regulations on use of tractors for off farm applications and create an industry out of that we need to intensify agriculture uh, uh, by increasing irrig irrigation facilitate cross border use of farm equipment you, if you look at other countries there are no restrictions for people to go from one county to other or one country to other you need to improve that to create a cross regional industry on mechanization for uh, you know uh, africa so, so the main policy issues are uh, government 
should really look at agriculture production uh, uh, and 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 uh, value chain development and situate mechanization in that. Uh, public sector's role should be defined defined more as creating enabling environment as opposed to you know doing everything. And we should really look at subsidies and transform them from subsidies to become smart incentives. And pricing of farm products should be also used in instrument to, to really improve mechanization. Financing uh, policies are required. And I think we, we, we should really look at how financing should be done in a very creative kind of way. And uh, uh, also the land ownership and other policies. Now, coming back to the World Bank's engagement, uh, we clearly are supporting policies and investments for food system transformation with strong focus on technology and mechanization. And we want to now convert this rather than uh, do it in an investment in a traditional way, we want to do results-based financing. So we want to do uh, now the new operations which will uh, really finance if we are achieving mechanization rates through a, a developed indices and then we can support governments who have achieved certain indicators there based on the results. Also, uh, mechanization across the value chain. Uh, we are not going to do standalone mechanization projects as we go forward. But the most important is to support the agri entrepreneurship ecosystem, which integrates data digitization, technology, and mechanization. We are now currently working with about 565 startups across Africa who are really working on this. And we really welcome, uh, uh, you know, creating, uh, working with the, you know, uh, uh, what George was describing, the agri drive and all the things, how we can develop that. Uh, personally, I feel that we need a lot of incubators and accelerators to create a network of startups and, you know, social enterprises, like you know, the, the startup companies, which will be able to work on mechanization, but not standalone mechanization bring in data, technology, and digital approaches there. Also, new financing approaches, which bundle inputs, markets, and mechanization, uh, and then develop pay-as-you-go financing approaches like solar energy to make mechanization aff affordable. Over to you. I, I, I look forward to the discussion as we go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pani. Our next presenter, who is Dr. Dr. Chris Omongo. Uh, Chris Nero has been linking smallholder farmers in Uganda with agricultural mechanization services for cassava and other crops. Please take us how this was achieved. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen. I hope it comes. It may take a little while. I think as the screen comes, can I proceed, Chair? Sure, you go ahead. All right, um, thank you very much for this opportunity. I hope the screen will pop in. Um, like you said, I'll, I will restrict myself on the efforts that narrow through the sector ministry and government has tried to make available mechanization, offer mechanization to farmers. One thing we need to notice is that uh, it is a long history that uh, farm mechanization in form of traction, animal traction, has been introduced in this country in the 50s. And indeed, as it evolved, it moved from just mere plowing to planting, weeding. But what is important is that over time, a lot of changes has been made on even animal traction. And that has helped our small farmers to progress. But as we move on, it became very clear that there was a need to service the economy. And in that, um, government brought in a new 
paradigm that is to service the cash crops of the country that was in the 60s and this was the advent of bringing in tractor use of course that is the beginning point because large production was now required and farmers were put together in groups and also block farming by, by that time land was not an issue and the government had a lot of uh, land all over the country so block farming came into effect and with that we started seeing things evolving but government was in charge especially when it came to managing the tractor system repairs and the like it was in the hands of government but through that the economy still went on well with the time people started evolving and saying it is not only the cash crop that we need and then other commodities started filtering in the hands of farmers now we are talking about commodities that in their own right have become cash crops rice maize cassava and the like so with the advent of this good enough narrow was coming on board there was now need to domesticate the kind of equipment that small oiler farmers could comfortably use and this was the time when narrow through maif started implementing what they call a dual model bringing in small equipment and then larger machineries for both tillage and then processing and this worked very well one of the biggest success stories we can talk about is actually the rise sustainable production in the country and this was around 2016 17 18 now this was a very good support from world bank to the government of uganda through naro and as we speak so many farmers adopted the power tillers the power tillers are very not cheap per se but very handy and cheap in terms of fuel consumption they don't take a lot of fuel but they work very efficiently and rice farmers many of them work in soggy ground and these power tillers are very suitable for that so as we speak so many farmers have adopted this and we have in the community a lot of these farmer tiller, power tillers in the hands of individual farmers close to about 50 one thing which we need to know is that while naro gives the technical support the specifications actually the availability of these power tillers and the like are from private sector so private sector are drawn on board to help and make it available to farmers within range from that point apart from just plowing there was also need for processing equipment in the same line there are both these were private sectors brought on board appropriate processing equipment and this has been very handy for maize has been very handy for rice has been very handy for um sogam and the like and they were within the reach of the farmers many farmers as farmer groups or as individuals ended up having them now if you look at the rice team the rice farmers they can supply a lot and if you look at the maize we have a thing over 40 um um seed companies handling maize alone in uganda and all these get service from our small older farmers including their own massive land this wouldn't have been a, a possible if these farmers are not graduated by using these uh well and appropriate power tillers it is working quite well the current success which we can discuss is actually graduating from that is support to mechanization along the commodity value chain this is now the way to go and i'm going to discuss with you two great success the first one hinges on what the business manager talked about uganda is one of the beneficiaries of kama and indeed kama injected close to 300000 dollars on agro machineries in uganda and this is in the model of farmers hiring and also the thinking is that it would trigger farmers Uh, interest after seeing the value and they would also purchase theirs now this has worked quite well for us but we need to take it to higher level what 
seem to be good for us is that because industrialists, private sector now see that cassava can be grown in large quantities through mechanization, there are a lot of medium to large scale processors that have come, both locally and internationally in Uganda. And as I speak now, seven have already established themselves in the country. What is important for us to note is that this private sector and the seven in total, they can consume in their potential way up to 300 tons of fresh cassava roots per day. If you translate this into acreage of cassava, you see that all of them are demanding up to 32 hectares of cassava per day. There is no other way you can manage this and make sure that business is going on if you don't heavily mechanize. And that is the point where we see from come up through ATF is making a lot of sense here. Just as they are establishing, there are many more who have already come on board and they are in the pipeline, seven. And in total, they are looking at 630 tons fresh cassava root per day. This has even taken the bar higher up to 65 hectares per day. This is heavy. And because there is business here and they see it, our role, therefore, is to make sure that the farmers service this. And what we are seeing is that this is the pool. This is the market. The new approach now, therefore, You hear me? Chair, can you hear me and the rest? I had lost you a bit. I was wondering oh. whether it is from my end. I lost you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there was That's a about. slide. Here. OK. All right. I, I was at the point of saying um, the processors are providing the market pool in the, in the country. And this is an opportunity for mechanization even to be taken to a higher level. But we think the approach which will work well now is to organize farmers around this market, around the processors. The good news is that these processors are not concentrated in the capital city. These processors are very strategic and they are in the countryside where there is plenty of land, where there is good water source and where there is good labor. So that is an opportunity for us who are promoting mechanization, narrow and maif, to rally our farmers who give the supply of the raw material around this market. And this has already started and we are doing it very well. Now, government in a bid to service the program of agri-industrialization has come in fully to support mechanization. Yes, tractorization is not the only one. Tractorization is the beginning point. And we need to make sure that that one first is taken to a good level because we need production to go up. And we also need productivity to be elevated. As we speak, government has moved ahead. Government has moved ahead and Purchase close to 500 tractors through NADS program, National Advisory Services, and also through Operation Well Creation. The model are five, and the community, the private sector, the individuals are free to select which model they want to go for. Now, whichever model you get, there is one issue. You must first have a down payment of 20%. And when that is seen in the account, you access the tractor and then the implement. And when you get it over to the community, you have to follow a clear guideline which government has put in place.
velocity again. So the participants we have lost him again. Well, colleagues, as uh, you, uh, you will be coming in to participate in the questions and answers, but in order to But uh, Chair, I, I will request for just a few more minutes so that I can conclude. If you may conclude, please. Okay, please. So, um, um, I was saying that government came on board to ensure that there are so many tractors. In the screen, it is 200. I updated my information. It is now 450. And there's a model that is being used, and there is clear guidelines. And these tractors are in the hands of farmer groups, private sector, individuals, and all is to improve product production and productivity of various crops in the country. I would like to proceed and mention a few things. While there are so many challenges we always meet in promoting mechanization, which I'm not going to over delve in it, I can summarize one, we need to make sure farmers are lifted in terms of knowledge, but what is important is we must move away from over emphasizing promotion of just production. Like everybody said, it is an entire value chain. And in our case, it's very easy because we now have a uh, market clear. There is the issue of support services from extension and then for machinery maintenance. This is highly lacking and is very important. That must be addressed. Otherwise, these floods of tractors will sooner than later sit there. So this must be handled, and it is being handled through Naro's mechanization unit. People are being trained, operators have been trained, mechanics have been trained. Mr. Chair, I think what needs to be done to promote this are not far away from what my colleagues have said, and I summarize them in terms of strategies and policies. Sincerely, the value chain approach is important, Let's make good use of viable farmer groups and let's link them to the market. No more farmer groups for the sake. They must be linked to the market. It's very important that the coordination and extension system is strong. Knowledge evolves every time. And that knowledge must always be available for farmers to use it. And that is the reason why we think IT should come in handy for information and also for business promotion. Very important. Government in Uganda should ensure the mechanization workshops, which used to be in the country, is revamped because there will be heavy material use and money will be there. Therefore, whoever has machineries will be able to pay for it. We need to revamp this. Good enough is getting in the hands of private people who are making business and they are training their own mechanics and operators. So there must be help so that there is services very close to people. Issues of quality standards. In research, there are so many commodities coming up. They must be touched to make mechanization. Look at the processing, small processing machines. If it is not well tied to the research, you can have maize cellar, which crushes all your maize. And it has happened before. Rice, granite. So research and the machine developers need to talk so that whatever comes out is appropriate. We also have the issue of taxes, tax incentive. It is very important that governments should not pull away and say private sector take on. Government's hand continues to remain to help people advance, to help 
um, processors advance, to help farmer groups advance, to help individual farmers advance. So the issue of taxes, tax regimes, and so on, must be addressed so that it can help progress along uh, across the board, not only in a selected manner. And with that, we think even the issue of credits can be discussed, and those who want to promote themselves from one level to another should be able to proceed. At the regional level, there are so many policy frameworks and, and, and strategies that should be harmonized. And I'm not going to go deep into it, but some of them is that there are policies around agricultural financing and the World Bank uh, official and the, uh, the panelists mentioned some of them. This should be domesticated and see that it works for the community along a value chain. The capacity of manufacturing of the agro machines we would like to see this domesticated and local. This would make it very appropriate. And then the issue of the environment. Machines should be appropriate and should not distort the environment. And this should be handled at the regional level. Issues to do with soil, soil fertility. In fact, some of the farmers have still the other negative thinking that agro mechanization or farm mechanization distorts soil fertility. To the contrary. So this should not be allowed to happen. And of course, the regional markets. If the regional markets are not absorbing the products elevated by agro machineries or farm mechanization, there will be a backlash. And we saw at the micro level in Uganda, one time when there was a lot of uh, production, boom, bumper production, cassava, maize, and so on. Farmers retreated. And that is not something we want. We want agro mechanization to really deliver what the business uh, officials say, 11 times return to investment. It must be felt, it must be seen by our farmers and everyone. Okay. I would like to thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And I thought I could just quickly within the time limited, the time given to me, mention this uh, to the panelists and to all our people who are following us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Who, can, who will share with us his experience of agco in facilitating access to efficient mechanization delivery models. And the, just a reminder, we are time bad if we could stick to our time and have a few questions to discuss at the end. Over to you, Madam Chitaji. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Let me just share my screen. Sorry, let me start okay. again. My screen is playing up. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, firstly, I would like to just thank, thank AATF for giving us this opportunity to participate in this session. Uh, my name is Kalongo. For the viewers who might not have been here earlier, and I'm senior manager at the Aqua Future Farm. The Aqua Future Farm, based in Osaka, Zambia, is a water demonstration farm whose, whose main objective is to support sustainable mechanization for both small and large uh, scale farmers. I think relevant to today's session is the work we are doing in support of small water farmers who would like to mechanize and who continue to face challenges in terms of mechanizing sustainably. So I'll just quickly go through some of the facts that drive uh, mechanization across the continent. And I know most of you all know already these are, these are some of this data. 
I think 79% of arable land, um, according to F, uh, FAO, is still uncultivated. So that tells us that we still have a lot of uh, work to do in terms of uh, cultivating and increasing production for the continent. And 40% uh, of the world's population uh, that has been alluded to by uh, previous speakers will be in Africa by the year 2100. So indeed, the demand for food will be increasing as well. And across sub-Saharan -Sub Africa, 48% of uh, people depend on agriculture as a livelihood. So I think all the statistics lead to one point, and that is that we need to increase production. And we know we cannot do it by using the hoe as our main uh, equipment for tillage. Uh, I'll, I'll continue again and just uh, underscore some of the other statistics around mechanization in sub-Saharan Africa. And from um, my presentation there, you can see that uh, South Asia, we are looking at 40% uh, of mechanization in sub-Saharan Africa, we're looking at 9%. And, and the other regions are also are significantly higher than mechanization in sub-Saharan Africa. Some key challenges to, to mechanization from our perspective, uh, one is distance to dealers. Um, and in some instances, dealers and suppliers of uh, equipment are non-existent. Then there's a lack of maintenance and knowledge in terms of mechanization and mechanizing agriculture as a whole. Our language and market dynamics are also some of the challenges, especially when it comes to farmers understanding product and gaining product knowledge. Uh, and of course, I think the most important is affordability perception and actual cost of mechanizing on the continent and for smallholder farmers particularly. So what are we doing as ARCO to facilitate access? So firstly, we've been working at developing appropriate mechanization solutions for smallholder farmers. Uh, and we conducted a pilot on agro-dealer machine hair services that I'm going to share in the next slides. Uh, the other thing we do is making sure that our equipment is not only appropriate, but is accessible uh, and also providing after self service and technology. And we also ensure that the smallholder farmer is supported through training, capacity building, and on-farm demonstration and trials. So I'll, I'll now talk about briefly about the pilot that we that we engaged in. So for three years, from 2017 to 2019, we piloted a smallholder mechanization hire solution to understand firsthand smallholder farmer challenges to mechanization and to assess uh, viability. So this, this uh, pilot was funded by ACO and DFID, and we piloted in two locations in Zambia with a catchment of 1,200 farmers. Uh, and we had following objectives for this pilot. Uh, one was to assess response of farmers to mechanization hire services. Uh, the other was to assess farmer ability to pay for these services. And we also wanted to evaluate impact on productivity and crop yields arising from availability of uh, engine power. So the outcome of this pilot was the farm in a box. So this is a branded uh, product, a small farmer, small order farm mechanism solution, and is delivered through the Aqua Future Farm uh, based here in based here in, in, in Osaka. But of course it is accessible uh, to all people living on the continent and outside. So what is in the farm in a box? The farm in a box contains um, a hot 80 horsepower tractor, uh, and it can have two or four wheel drive. And, and the reason why we drop the horsepower is to ensure that uh, it, it benefits from the ribbit in terms of taxes and duties that is imposed on uh, tractors below 80 horsepower, particularly in Zambia. Uh, it also comes with matched implements, um, and this can be depending on demand, but typically the, it contains a reaper, a disc harrow, a trailer, and, and a planter. Uh, the farm in the box also comes with a stocking list of spare parts for up to 3,000 hours uh, of use of the equipment. Uh, it, it also comes with a workshop, so workshop tools 
a, a bench tools, air compressor, generator, because we, we are also thinking that we're placing this equipment mostly in rural areas or in outskirts on farm on farmland. It also comes with telemetry tracking uh, to monitor use of these tractors. Uh, and for us, for the part, we wanted to see how often this tractor was used and, and all other kinds of data that we're able to get for, from it. Uh, the farm in the box also um, comes with further options because we would like to think the farm in the box can also be a one-stop shop for farmers. So it can, they can also be linked to strategic partners, including uh, irrigation equipment, uh, seed suppliers, fertilizer suppliers, uh, and other services that small farmers require. So farm in a box, the target market, because we know that uh, most smaller farmers cannot afford to individually buy uh, equipment. So the farm in a box is targeted at distributors who would like to buy the farm in a box as a contracting service. We also target um, you know, professionals or urban best uh, uh, entrepreneurs who would be interested in buying the package and taking it into a particular location and, and provide higher services. We also target agro dealers who can add on the farm in a box as a package on top of input supply or, or seed broking uh, businesses. Uh, we also target government and NGOs for their you know, farmer group projects, community programs, uh, and also for public-private partnerships, farmer grouping, associations who can pull focus together and, and, and procure this, uh, this package. Uh, and we also look at private sector investors uh, and actually recently we've seen more and more interest out of private sector investors into procuring the farm in a box. Uh, the other thing we do uh, is to improve access, of course, access through um, the, the, our distribution network or through the future farm uh, to ensure that the smallholder farmers um, are able to know where you know, information can be found. And if, if it's at the future farm where we demonstrate this equipment, they can actually come onto the farm and see the equipment, get a feel of it, see how it works, and we also uh, you know, ensure they participate and they are free to participate in all our demonstrations, crop trials, and also the training. Um, and we also you know, ensure that we can uh, link our farmers uh, and even uh, entrepreneurs who buy the equipment to companies that can provide them with tracking, uh, tracking software, uh, GPS, and all kinds of telemetry and agricultural technologies. Then we conduct training. Um, I, th I think that through the AquaFuture Farm, uh, we would like to differentiate uh, between just um, mere tractorization or mechanization, and that is sustainable mechanization. And we think that for mechanization to be sustainable, which is economically, socially, you know, equitable, it has to has to come with a lot of capacity and training, uh, and also to ensure that farmers are exposed to what you know what they can benefit from from mechanization, but also for them to actually receive all the full benefits of mechanization. So we have um, eight modules that we, we roll out uh, through the Future Farm or uh, in more recent times through our website on our digital learning platform. Uh, so we look at mechanization also holistically and as you know, cutting across the value chain. So not just tillage, but also uh, you know, looking at crop nutrition, uh, harvesting, uh, storage, um, and we also look at operator and mechanics training and, and, and look at crop protection. So we think that it's a holistic approach that really needs to be there for mechanization to be sustainable. But the other thing that we've also learned is that with smallholder farmers, we really need to consider issues of language, we need to consider issues of uh, literacy, uh, we need to consider issues of gender, for instance, and all other cultural issues that you know, surround agriculture and mechanization. So what have we learned from this, um, this pilot? Uh, a number of things actually, but key uh, is that access to, having access to mechanization, as small, small water farmers were able to increase their farm yields by 30% in the first crop, cropping season of the pilot. Uh, and on top of that, there is demand. Uh, small water farmers would like to mechanize, and especially if they can mechanize through a service a provision rather than outright purchase of equipment. And we, and we saw that uh, demand doubled uh, in the second year of the pilot. 
Uh, however, we also saw that despite ACO support during the pilot, the equipment still experienced regular breakdowns, and this was mainly due to low operator skills and also uh, low levels of understanding of operators because of uh, low literacy levels. Uh, we also saw that introduction of mechanization requires comprehensive theoretical and hands-on operator and mechanics training. So it's not just a question of uh, handing out um, tractors to an operator, but also continuous process of training. Other lessons were that small water farmer training must be practical, more learning by doing, and consider literacy and language constraints, as I've already mentioned. Uh, and we also saw that mechanization is only viable with availability of spares, after sales support, and well-trained operators. So in terms of logistics, that's very important. Uh, and also in terms of being able to quickly provide a uh, quick response to farmers or to operators or tractor owners when there's a problem is very key. Uh, and also that mechanization must be promoted on the principles of environmental sustainability. Otherwise, there'd be more damage to the environment and the land. Uh, and we also really uh, saw that improving agronomy practices and farm business management is key to ensuring farmers realize surplus income to invest in mechanization. Uh, private sector challenges and recommendations. Firstly, I would like to say that for smallholder farmers, that is a category of farmers that still need a lot of government support. Uh, so we cannot remove government from this equation. So high import taxes and duties, especially on tractors above 100 horsepower, um, really make uh, the sector very expensive and the cost of business are quite high for private sector. So there, there's need for government to come in with deliberate policies uh, to either provide rebates or incentives so that mechanization can be promoted and that cost of equipment can be brought down to benefit smallholder farmers. We also see market distortions caused by poor quality or sometimes unsuitable equipment that is procured on large uh, programs uh, and usually government pro programs. Uh, so we think that government needs to engage with private sector to draw on their technical expertise before they design these programs so that they can benefit from uh, you know, knowing what type of machine is good, even the technologies, and also you know, benefit from some of the, the studies that our private sector and other non-government organizations engage in uh, you know, before they do these programs. Then there's a lack of trained operators and the lag be lagging behind in agricultural technologies. And we think that agricultural training curriculum should include comprehensive equipment and machine operator training, you know, updated modules on agriculture technologies, and, and, and even just uh, well equipping the agriculture training institutes very well so that learners are exposed to mechanization before they enter industry. Then unfavorable agriculture policy um, around, you know, maize controls, a low investment in the sector, a lack of controls on, you know, on imports, they all make, uh, you know, they reduce the profitability of local farmers in any, you know, given country. Uh, and, and we think that government needs to promote favorable agricultural policies and also support uh, local projects so that farmers can, you know, make money and farming can be more, more profitable so that they can have money to invest in, you know, in mechanization and other farm investments. So um, really, in short, I would like to say that, you know, mechanization really is a, it requires a multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral approach, uh, you know, looking at, you know, environmental sustainability, social equity, and, 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 and all these other players that, you know, would develop a, a, a very robust value chain, and culture value chain for smallholder farmers particularly, so that they can also, you know, see the profit and the benefit uh, in mechanizing. Uh, I think for now I'll end here. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Karongo, for those different models you have described. And uh, since we are bad of time, I will, will go straight and I will come Brent Hudson. Brent Clay has been championing digital solutions to facilitate agricultural mechanization. Tell us much, tell us more about your experience in this area. Over to you, Brent. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's great to be here. And uh, Welcome to, to all the panelists and, and, and viewers. Um, if you just give me a few seconds, let me share my screen. Okay. 
There we go. Will you let me know if you can see? Great. Um, so I think before I get into the topic of discussion, let me give you a brief overview of, of what we do at Kara. Um, we're a, a digital solution provider working in the agricultural sector, providing aerial crop analysis, uh, crop spraying solutions, and mainly using drone technology uh, um, while also developing our own software to, to bring precision agriculture to the African continent. Uh, we collect, analyze, and action uh, um, in-field data to enhance efficiencies um, on farms and have been doing so for, for the past few years. Um, so during this discussion, I'll, I'll be covering the following topics, uh, the role of digital solutions, um, the role they can play in enhancing agriculture, uh, agricultural mechanization, what lessons we can draw from our experiences, and what providers of, of digital solutions need to perform their roles better. So let's start by taking a look at what we mean by digital tools and where they fit into to the agricultural value chain today. I think at a foundational level, digital tools across all industries enable us to capture, analyze, exchange uh, um, information and uh, excuse me, information and, and really drive uh, um, efficiencies through, throughout the entire value chain. And this is no different in, in agriculture. At the end of the day, as uh, a couple of my colleagues have mentioned, our, our shared objective should be to maximize yield per, per hectare of, of land. But it's important to note that digital tools are only a piece of this uh, efficiency puzzle. And mechanization also has a massive role to play in achieving this objective which is why the projects that the AATF are involved in are so valuable. So moving on to the, the first topic and, and what role uh, digital solutions can play in enhancing access to agricultural mechanization in Africa. So I think me mechanization in, in agriculture is critical if we hope to make agri uh, um, Africa a, a global powerhouse in, in agricultural production. Unfortunately, mechanization has been a relatively scarce resource across large parts of, of the continent. And so the question becomes, how, how do we use digital tools in a way that can increase this access to, to mechanization? And I think, first of all, we need to identify what some of the key issues are, which are inhibiting uh, access to, to mechanization across the, the continent. I think historically there's been a, a knowledge gap, as, as some of my colleagues have alluded to, uh, within the agricultural sector regarding new technologies and, and how they can be integrated into the, the agricultural value chain. And this is something we, uh, as Kara encounter quite, quite regularly. Uh, farmers are, are not exposed to new technologies enough, and bridging this knowledge gap really centers around educating farmers about the costs and benefits of using machinery and, and new technologies within their operations. I think uh, another key issue, um, and I think the, the most obvious one, has been the costs involved uh, um, with mechanization and the fact that a lot of small farmers just can't afford uh, to purchase a machine of their own or, or lack the ability to, to get finance. So again, this, this alludes to, to the question, how, how do we use digital technologies to try and overcome these two problems. And I think although these appear to be fairly substantial problems um, to overcome, they are problems which digital solutions are particularly good at solving. And um, in dealing with the knowledge gap, for example, digital tools have, have proven to be highly effective in, in creating knowledge sharing initiatives. And um, for example, using cell phones and, and applications and uh, um, relatively available digital product, uh, products, excuse me. Uh, uh, farmers can contact, collaborate, share information amongst themselves uh, um, in ways that have previously not, not been able to or, or not been possible. And um, we can use digital tools uh, um, to create these information networks, uh, which farmers can, can tap into. Um, and that's small scale farmers, medium scale farmers, large scale farmers. Uh, um, f farmers in general. And um, one, one example of these 
knowledge sharing initiatives is is a, a startup company called WeFarm. And uh, WeFarm, for example, is, is the largest farmer to farmer digital network, um, if, if I'm not mistaken, in the world, um, with approximately 1 million uh, um, farmers using the platform in Kenya and Uganda alone. And um, I think, so, so moving on to the cost side of things uh, um, and the problem of, of uh, um, accessing machinery, I think countries like uh, um, Bangladesh have been particularly effective in, in, in solving these types of problems. And, and they've really given us a, um, somewhat of a, ro a roadmap, which, which I think is um, uh, important for us to, to acknowledge and, and perhaps take some, some lessons from. And one thing that, that they managed to really focus on was creating rental markets. Um, and I know uh, a, a couple of my colleagues mentioned uh, um, uh, the effectiveness of, of these markets and, and these cooperative exchanges. Um, and in, in essence, uh, um, what they do is they reduce the uh, uh, need for large capital outlays um, from small scale farmers and, and really, really encourage access to, to, to machinery. And um, today, approximately 72% of, of uh, farmers in Bangladesh have some kind of access to mechanization as a result of these rental markets. And um, in, in Africa, digital applications like Hello Tractor in, in Nigeria, Axel in South Africa, Trotro Tractor in, in Ghana, and AgriDrive uh, um, have, have really been able to, to provide farmers with enhanced access to, to, to these rental markets um, for agricultural machinery. And from what we've seen in Nigeria, these platforms are very effective at reducing transaction costs for farmers and, and make, that's mainly through through linking them directly with with tractor owners and um, through enhanced access to to information um, in conjunction with the, this reduction in costs digital tools are, are really already playing quite an important role in enhancing um, access to to mechanization in Africa but as uh, um, usual there's there's obviously more that can be done. So moving, moving on to the next topic uh, and, and what lessons we can draw um, from deploying our, our digital uh, um, solutions. So I, I think one of the, the biggest lessons we can draw uh, um, from the deployment of, of digital solutions in, in most industries is that they, again, are, um, are just merely part of the production function and, and cannot operate in, in isolation. They can be used to make processes highly, highly efficient, but that's if the foundations are, are in place to begin with. And uh, for, for example, optimal agricultural practice, uh, um, excuse me, if, if suboptimal uh, agricultural practices are, are, are being used, a digital solution is, is probably not going to make up for that. Um, I think another lesson uh, um, we, we can learn is that Something, and, and this is something I think is um, that is critical for us to to bear in mind as we as we try and integrate these digital tools, particularly in an African context, um, is the impact that these tools can have on on behavioural and, and, and cultural norms. And I think it's it's only once we understand these factors um, that we can really hope to get a uh, hundred um, percent buy-in from from small scale farmers throughout Africa. Um, and I think, as, as I mentioned previously, knowledge plays a, a critical part in, in enhancing this access to, to mechanization. But I think it's, it's particularly important for, for the service providers and, and the digital service providers like us to also educate ourselves and, and try and understand where our technologies fit in uh, to this existing uh, um, ecosystem. And I think one of the, the largest uh, um, hurdles that we face uh, um, when reaching out to, to small scale farmers is often they're, they're, they're in extremely re uh, remote locations with very poor uh, transport and, and communication infrastructure. And um, a, a famous um, agronomist, uh, Fritz Brugger, uh, said that it's the last mile of, uh, um, to the farmer's gate or the first mile of the value chain where most well-intended projects fail. Um, and, and that's something we as, as Karai have, have definitely noticed. Um, I think uh, um, one of the peculiarities um, of delivering digital tools is, is that often they tend to be designed for, for commercial applications and, and commercial farms. 
Um, and, and that obviously implies that there's already relatively good infrastructure in place, which, which as I mentioned, with small scale farmers is, is often not the case. That being said, what we have managed to identify is that using digital tools, there's, there's often a way uh, um, around most problems. And I think that's the, the beautiful thing about digital technologies is, is that they're often highly adaptable. And um, as I mentioned, that's, that, that's something we work on uh, um, with Karai. It's, it's, it, you, we can never just go with a, a single approach um, to smallholder farmers. Each, each smallholder farmer tends to, uh, um, tends to uh, um, bring with them their, their own sets of challenges. And it's up to us as, as the digital service provider to try and uh, um, adapt our technology to, to, to be able to service them. So I think due to the relatively low levels of mechanization in Africa, it, it's critical that we use the uh, use digital tools to really help us allocate the, the available machinery in a much more efficient way. And this is something we, we really focus on as, as Kura. And one example of this is, is through the use of smart pesticide prescriptions. And what, what we've identified in, in, in the past few years is that it's no longer necessary to uh, blanket spray fields with pesticides. And um, instead, what, what, what we're able to do is use digital tools to show us where the problem areas are and to target those areas only. And this means that a tractor can be used for another task, perhaps, or perhaps even rented to a neighbor. So on to the last topic and uh, um, what do providers of digital solutions need to, to perform their roles better? So I think what, what we need to do is, is distinguish between what would make our lives easier versus what we actually need to, to perform our roles better. Uh, for example, high-speed broadband across the whole of Africa would certainly make our lives easier, but it's not a realistic, uh, um, it's not realistic. And in fact, we've actually found ways um, around this problem, which mean we can still operate uh, um, quite effectively. And um, I think so, according to the Global Open Do uh, Data for Agriculture and Nutrition Report, the following problems continue to persist amongst smallholder farmers. And, and, and they are lack of information, weak telecommunications infrastructure, and the fact that the vast majority of farmers cannot directly afford digital technologies for a small plot of land. So I think to, to really en enhance the effectiveness of, of digital solutions, these problems need to be addressed. And this again speaks to the, uh, the interdependency of, of the agricultural industry on, on other industries. Um, and if there is no, for, for example, if there's no effective communication links to a farmer, it really makes it difficult for, for us as digital uh, uh, service providers to contact the farmer and, and offer them a, a, a service or a product. So what I think is, is, is also critical for, for us to perform our roles better is, is a willingness from, from communities and, and farmers to embrace new ways of performing old tasks. And um, because what, one of the main things that, that Karai is doing is, is we're identifying huge inefficiencies within the agricultural value chain at, at a very fast pace. But sometimes it's, it's difficult to, to get buy-in from the farmers and to get the farmers to, to change their approach. And I think, again, education is, is absolutely crucial for us to, to, to grow Africa. And we need people in, in remote locations to experience the effects of, of new technologies before we actually arrive on their doorstep with the, with the product. And um, I think the, the, the responsibility also lies with, with us as, as the digital solution providers um, to help drive this, this type of education. I think um, often we, we're a bunch of technology gurus who, who understand the science behind our own products, but we struggle to, to put it in, in terms that a farmer would, would understand. And um, that's, that's crucial to, to, uh, for, for people to actually experience how digital tools can help drive their production rather than to just hear about it. And um, I think that's, that's how we, we really change people's mindsets about technology. So I think, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for your time.
Thank you very much, uh, Beth, for that insightful presentation on the digital tools and especially on the lessons that have been learned. Colleagues, we are already 10 minutes beyond and we would like to bring this to the end. But uh, one of our colleagues we're expecting uh, joined us later. We'll give him two minutes so that he had a quarter past, and rather quarter to, uh, to mid uh, to, ten, to four here, we close. And this is uh, Dr. Cypress Noara who is the head of division of the agriculture and food security at the Department of Rural Economy and Agriculture and the African Union. So, simply, you are welcome and we're already beyond, but you can give us some two minutes to share with your ideas about the, you know, the way the uh, EU is planning on agriculture mechanization. Over to you, simply. Director, uh, Mr. Dr. Dennis, and I will only take five minutes, not more than five minutes. First, because the first question that I was asked was how can mechanization contribute to the CADEP agenda? And I think all of the presentation that I have listened this afternoon shows that the CADEP agenda, that is the Malabo Declaration of Ending Hunger, Tripling Entire Africa Trade, Poverty reduction, we cannot transform agriculture in Africa if we don't embrace mechanization. I don't want to go into the detail. We cannot achieve the agricultural transformation if we don't take deliberate effort to embrace uh, mechanization. And how can, can this be happen? Or how can we achieve mechanization on the continent? I think this is a question that we should be asking ourselves. And for those of us who have passed a certain age, we know that in the 80s, there was a great move of improving mechanization uh, in agriculture on the continent until we had the structural adjustment program that came and somehow stopped all this move. I think today we need to take a deliberate effort as government to reinvest into mechanization. And at the African Union, we have developed together with AFU what we call the Sustainable Agricultural Mechanization Strategy. And this strategy has been developed and endorsed by ministers, and it is, in our view, the roadmap to really fast track mechanization in Africa. I won't go into the details of the actions, but when you look at the various actions that are highlighted in this uh, strategy, we think that with this we can achieve sustainable mechanization in Africa. And to bring in more political support, uh, we launched as a commission last year what we call a campaign to con confine the harm home in the museum. Because we think it's good to have technical uh, direction, but we also need this political, this strong political advocacy uh, to uh, advance mechanization in Africa. So we launched this campaign to confine the harm home in the museum. And during the campaign, we take the opportunity to advocate to head of state, to policymakers, all the need to invest in sustainable mechanization. I was asked, what lessons can we pick from what has happened basically in, in Asia and the rest? And so we should be careful not to copy and paste. We need to develop a model of me sustainable mechanization that fit the context of Africa. We can learn from what has happened in Asia, but we should be careful not to copy and paste. Copy and paste is a mistake that we should not do. And I've listened to the presentation, from, I, I can't remember the, the, the presentation again, but then, uh, I think Dr. Kalongo, where you could see that on the continent there are examples on which we can build to advance mechanization. So yes, we have a model in, in, in Asia, but this model should be adapted to the continent based on our 
uh, uh, context in order to advance mechanization. I'm sorry I'm trying to put the video, but they're having serious internet challenge here. Let me just put it towards the end so that if internet goes, at least you can see my face. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. okay. Thank you very Thank much, you very uh, much uh, Chris, for, for that. that uh, we should, we should notice. notice. Colleagues, we have had uh, good, present, uh, good questions and from the public, from you, the audience. But with the time remaining, I would ask uh, our panelists to answer them in the chat and uh, we come to a close. Uh, there, are, there are two questions I've been asked, to, I've been informed we could answer them, and then the rest will be answered on the chat. One is from Jichuji uh, Wachinga. How do we ensure that mechanization in Africa does not follow the traditional emissions intensive deployment pathways in the developed countries? It is not addressed any, but can any of the panelists answer this, please? Amish, can you attempt to that? Mr. Chair. Yes, please. I'm sorry. Yeah, Kalongo, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, I could respond and just give the ACO point of view. I think for us, that's why it's important that we, we continually keep um, going back to the drawing board with our research and development to ensure that not just the use of mechanization, but also uh, how we produce it and how we market it and how we promote it so that issues of environmental management and environmental responsibility are, are, are taken care of. One way we are doing that is by, by promoting, for instance, promoting reaping as opposed to plowing all the time. Uh, because we know that uh, people think that mechanization is just plowing, but there are times when you don't need to plow your land, you can just till it. Uh, so really appropriate use and, and training and promoting appropriate use is one way in which we make sure that we, we don't have those traditional emissions and the intensive development that you know has, has been witnessed in other, in other areas. So I think capacity building, uh, a focus on environmental responsibility are very key to this process. Thank you very much, Kalongo. Uh, we have another one from Alex in Nigeria. It is addressed to Pamesh. With the World Bank, with the World Bank adequate knowledge on the potentials of mechanization, can we hear any of the deliberate attempts by the bank to encourage African countries to mechanize their agriculture? Pamesh, please. Uh, thanks. thanks, Dennis. So I think uh, the earlier question also was important. So I think the mechanization has to become very build on the innovations which are happening in the country. We have found that vanilla kind of solutions which we have tried to develop you know, in a blueprint way have not worked earlier. So basically what we are trying to do in like in Uganda and Nigeria, all the other places, what we are trying to do is to build on the existing successes which are uh, already there basically. So, so I think the important thing I think is now to take the kind of uh, say 50 or 100 use cases in Africa, which have worked and then really build strategies based on that. So it's more like an organic scaling up as opposed to trying blueprint ways of doing it because we have funded in the past large mechanization programs and all, but the impact has not been there. But the examples we heard today if we just harvest these examples and try to build incubation and acceleration around that, it will be there. We are trying now similar things in some countries, but I think it's early days. But I think our focus is now on combining mechanization with the food systems uh, transformation, processing, harvesting, uh, post-harvest, and then also the conservation agriculture and, and try to create some kind of an ecosystem when Thank you, Pamesh. Thank you. If dear participants, as I said, it has been a very interactive session, but uh, we've gone beyond our time. I will just give just a few seconds to each of our panelists to give their final remark. Can we start with the, um, Madam Kalongo, please?
Madam Kalwango, you are not there? Can we go to Pamesh then? I think uh, what I want to say is that I have uh, really learned a lot for today and we are committed to working with all the stakeholders uh, in, in, in Africa to really bring uh, a kind of an innovative entrepreneurial mindset to mechanization and uh, really support building of these ecosystems, which I think we have elements of it. We don't have to borrow it from Asia, it says we have a lot of elements of innovation which is happening in Africa and uh, we would like to build an innovation ecosystem around, uh, you know, uh, uh, mechanization, uh, not just for plumbing, but for value chain and other things and also create an ecosystem for entrepreneurship around, uh, you know, uh, bringing these large scale Thank changes. Thank you very much. Madam Kalongo, please, are you back? You are parting short. You are muted. You are on the mute. Your uh, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chair, I've been told that the equivalent of your on mute, still on mute, is uh, I'm stuck in traffic. So, <laughs> um, uh, sorry, Mr. Chair, I didn't hear what your question was. No, just a parting shot. What message do you want to give to the okay. audience? Um, I, I think I have two, two, two parting words. I think that mechanization uh, is the only way we are going to move from where we are now to the next level. Uh, we, we have a lot of land in Africa. Uh, agriculture is our mainstay on the continent. And I think that with the same intensity and passion we've put towards uh, mobile telecommunications, the same passion we need to put towards mechanization. Uh, the other comment is that we, we need to begin to teach our next generation to have agriculture as a lifestyle, because that is the only way we're going to embed it in all our areas of life, because after all, everybody eats. So I think that agriculture should not be seen as a form of drudgery, for instance, or seen as the last thing you do when you can't succeed. I think agriculture should be the first thing that we should think about for the next generation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Karongo. Blant, your parting shot, please. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for, for having me and, and thanks to all the panelists. I think my, my parting shot would be that I think we, we're reaching an incredibly exciting time, particularly in, in, in Africa. And um, I mean, as, as my panelists, uh, as my colleagues uh, um, mentioned, Africa's, it's got the potential to become the, the, the next powerhouse uh, um, in terms of agriculture, and, and it's a great, uh, it's great to to be part of it, and and to see all of the expertise that are going to be a part of this journey. Um, so I think my, my parting shot is is the future is looking bright, Thank you. and Thank I'm excited. Thank you very much, Brent. Thank you, Chris. Over to you, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, from what we have discussed today, I think what is very clear is that. Uh, Mechanization promotion is progressive. And in that respect, therefore, the issue of appropriateness of the machinery is very important so that no segment of the stakeholder is left behind. In addition to that, we have also seen that financing, financial support from government and others is very key because that will trigger progression from one level to another. And in addition to that, therefore, the market must be made available. And that will even trigger more uh, progression to a, a higher and more sophisticated mechanization process. If that is done, then the kind of growth we are yearning to see in our society will definitely come over time. So that is how I envision uh, how to promote Mechanization Thank you very much. Uh, Simply, Thank you. do you have any parting shot for us? It's a very quick, a very quick one. Uh, five years back, and I will, I will finish by that. The, 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 a French president visiting Africa said, speaking to our agricultural sector, say Africa should enter into the civilization because for him. 
They could not believe that in the 20th century we could continue to use hand home. Many of us took it as an insult to the continent, but I thought it was a wake-up call to all the continent. We should move the top and take deliberate action to invest and advance mechanization on the continent. Thank you very much. Last but not least, George. Oh, thank you, Dennis. Uh, my parting shot is to highlight that uh, transforming African agriculture needs appropriate agriculture technologies, one of which is the digital agriculture and mechanization. I think we can all understand and uh, we highly appreciate the fact that mechanization can actually uh, increase productivity, reduce drudgery, increase efficiency, and create wealth. So this is an opportunity that we want all farmers to, in, to embody on so that we can actually be able to make money and create wealth for the smallholder farmers who constitute at least more than 75% of the farmers in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, George. Uh, dear participants, first and foremost, I want to bring in our apologies for the few hiccups we had for some of our panelists. But I'm glad the participation has been great. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for gracing us with this second web that we have had today. And uh, on behalf of AATF and the entire production team, I want to extend um, my hearty thanks to our panelists who have really given us an insightful and sharing knowledge of, on this subject we had today. And again, thanks to you all the audience for your presence and your con constructive engagement throughout the webinar. And we look forward to in our subsequent webinars to be with you. Thank you. Ascent in Sana, that is thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, bye for now. Thank you. Bye bye.